what that really means to transition from per performative to embodied. Like those are easy words to say, but if someone hasn't had that experience, let's kind of paint the picture for them. And let me just say, if you're not used to use, hearing the word performative in the context of sex, we're talking about treating sex as a performance, treating sex as something that looks a particular way, that gives your partner a particular experience versus really having sex be something that lives in your body that you're sharing with someone else. That's, that's how I would say it. How, how would you say it? Or do you have a story of a client you've worked with that you might share what that pivot is? Because I think as we go further, understanding what the pivot is and what it's going to will be really helpful because we have plenty of images. Most people have plenty of images of what porn looks like, but what does this look like that we want to be talking about? It's a great question. And I think it's one of those questions we could, we could talk about that for an hour, I bet, honestly. Um, but, but I think foundationally we're confused about sex because we think it's something we do with somebody else instead of understanding that our relationship with our own sexuality is the foundational relationship. This is my primary relationship. And if I want to have great sex with other people and who, who doesn't want to have great sex, but if I want that first, I need to learn how to have great sex with myself and to be connected to my own sexuality in a loving, self-nurturing, beautiful way. And uh, if we don't feel good about our body, if we've got shame messages, trauma history, uh, cultural negativity that's been piled on in every way throughout our lives, if we haven't cleared that out, it's hard to have sex from the inside. Instead, of and let's add to that list. Like you, you gave some great things on the list, and I would add seeing sex as a marital duty, or as as um, as any kind of a a transactional thing that you provide sex so that your partner provides the house you live in. I mean, like yes, we can talk in broad societal terms. But I think it would be really worthwhile as you listen to this to consider what are the either invisible or overt contracts that you have with your partner that has you believe you should be having sex with him or her. I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm just saying notice those invisible contracts. Right. Well, notice the shoulds and the shouldn'ts. Right? Yes. What if, yeah. what, what are your beliefs around sex? What did you learn about it? Uh, what are your experiences? And when we start to look at that, then we can come to a place where our sexuality is something that we choose to explore with ourselves and we make choices, healthy, self-loving choices about who we share that with. And again, we have a lot of cultural messages about who you should or shouldn't be having sex with. And they're very different messages. Um, there's no, we're in the like no win, right? Cause if you have too much sex with too many people, then you're a slut. If you don't have enough sex with enough people or the right people or the, your partner or something, then you're a prude, right? So this has been, this was the true when I was a teenager. <laughs> it's true now, the sort of you can't win kind of setup we have. So I think again, this gets back to our relationship with ourselves and learning what's true for us, how we operate, uh, not just the parts we have, which is really important, but also uh, mentally, emotionally, how our heart works. Um, it's about learning healthy boundaries, something we don't talk about enough, but how do we actually know what we want? How do we communicate with other people about our boundaries? How do we understand how they change and grow and, um, and how we teach somebody 
um, about our boundaries or how to be a good lover to us. Because nobody is born knowing how to have great sex with a partner. 